Hello, and welcome to Harder Than It Looks, Parking Uncovered, a podcast to facilitate connections and illuminate real solutions to common problems within the parking and mobility industry. I'm Brian Wolf, President and CEO of Parker Technology, and I'll be your host as we speak with parking professionals from across the industry at all levels to uncover tips, tricks, and best practices to manage what we all know is harder than it looks parking a car. Today is a big day for me and for Parker Technology. It's the day we launch our podcast. So let me tell you a little bit about what to expect. We all know that parking is hard, but we also know that parking is made easier and is made better because of the special people in parking. So of course, I'll bring guests on and I hope to uncover a little bit of their history But more importantly, I'd like to dig a little bit deeper, and I'd like to get into what they feel like made them successful in an effort to help you understand some of the tips and tricks that they use that could ultimately help you be more successful in your job. Typically, each segment will have two or three segments. And so in segments two and three, what I'd like to do is explore other areas that are hard. We know that parking is hard, but there are other jobs that are hard to do as well. So for example, in the first couple of podcasts, you'll encounter um, information about flying an airplane or starting a company or running a triathlon because we know those things are hard too. I thought maybe we would introduce a little perspective for you so that you don't feel like you're the only one who has a hard job. So Full disclosure, I want you to know that hosting a podcast is one of those things that's harder than it looks. And so I'll ask for your indulgence as I get comfortable in the hosting chair and as I get better. I like to think of it like fine wine or great bourbon. I'll get better with time. So stick with me, hang in there, and, uh, and over time I think I'll get better. So a little bit about me personally. So I've been in parking for seven and a half years, which is as long as I've been the CEO of Parker Technology. And during that time, Parker has grown from supporting 45 facilities to nearly 900 facilities, which is about a 19 or 20 fold increase. But I can tell you that we're just getting started. So before Parker, I co-founded a technology company called Blue Lock. And at Blue Lock, we transformed the way IT resources were consumed. Today, we know cloud computing as the standard, right? Every startup goes to the cloud because the cloud is more efficient and it just makes it easier to start a company. Back in 2006, when we started Blue Lock, that was not the case. And so we, we helped as the IT industry underwent its own digital transformation. Today, we know that parking itself is also going through a digital transformation. Things are changing fast in parking. And so what I hope to do is take some of the experience that I learned during the digital transformation of IT and bring that forward into my experience here at Parker, all with the goal of helping you do your job better. Finally, I'd like to share just a little bit about me personally. So I've been married nearly 29 years to my beautiful bride, Jill. We have two awesome children. And a little secret that's, if you know me, is not so secret. You know that I believe that any great journey or trip has to contain three elements. It's got to have golf, it's got to have bourbon, and it's got to have gambling. So with that... Uh, I'd like to kick off the show and welcome you on our journey into the world of podcasting, and hopefully you'll enjoy listening to it as much as we've enjoyed producing it. Let's go. On the show today is Brett Harwood, a renowned parking industry magnet. Brett Harwood is a well-known, some might even say famous, member of the parking community for several decades. He describes himself as a lawyer-turned-business executive, a family man, and someone who's passionate about philanthropy and volunteerism. Brett is a former president of the National Parking Association, has owned and operated many parking facilities in the New York and surrounding areas, and is also a very active angel investor in parking technology companies. So without further ado, 
Please welcome Brett Harwood. Brett, welcome to Harder Than It Looks. Thank you, Brian. I must confess, this is the first podcast I've ever done. Oh. I will try to present my best face forward, which I've always done, and try and illuminate people that are listening. Hopefully, they'll come out of this podcast, certainly with a little more knowledge than they might have had, or a smile, or if they turn it off in the middle, you'll miss the big ending that I have. So stay tuned. I have to tell you, I wanted you to be our first guest. I did not know that this is your first podcast, but I wanted you to be our first guest because when I think about parking people and people that have endured all of the changes that have taken place in parking and have thrived in parking, I think about Brett Harwood, truly. There are a couple that I think of, but certainly Brett Harwood is right at the top of the list for sure. I I do go way back. I don't want to disclose my age, but I have a significant birthday coming up in February, oh. if anybody uh, wants to celebrate with me. And uh, I will tell you what I've witnessed over the course of my career. And my career in the parking industry really starts earlier than my official career, because my family grew up in the parking business, uh -oh. um, starting by my grandfather and four brothers on the Lower East Side of New York, who got a loan from my great grandfather to open a trolley barn that had been closed down and park cars, I think, for a nickel a day. Wow. And that was in 1920. But I'm not that old, so take, <laughs> just hold your horses a second. But when I was young and my dad uh, would work on Saturday nights and come home with the money from the parking lots and have to count it before he went to bed, and my grandmother, who was in the business, she counted much better than my dad, I want you to know, and made That's sure funny. there was nothing missing in the counting. And in summers, before I could drive, I would work collecting money in the parking lot. Pay as you enter, I want you to know. It's <laughs> always pay as you enter. And I learned to drive on a parking lot. I learned to I learned to how to paint a booth on the parking lot, collect garbage. This is all in high school. And then I went to college, went to law school, and as they say, fast forward, I ended up in, in the parking industry. Yeah, so that's funny. Okay, so what made you want to go to law school? It sounds like parking was in your blood. Did you have experiences that led you to believe that you were eventually going to escape parking? I, I will be, as I am, usually serious about things like this. As a Jewish kid, you grew up either to be a doctor or a lawyer, okay? Yeah. In fact... I hope you don't mind, but there's a joke about they're inaugurating the first Jewish president and his mother's sitting in the audience next to the vice president. And she turns <laughs> to the vice president. She says, that's my son. He's the first Jewish president. And he says, I know I'm the vice president. She says, but my other son, he's a doctor. OK, <laughs> and so I found out early in college that I had no ability for science and math, candidly. So the next alternative was I'm going to go to law school. And um, I had no intention of being in the parking industry. But fast forward, the firm I was with, the firm I was with separated, the two partners separated. Three associates got together. We decided to join the younger of the partners in a new firm. And unfortunately, he was the worst manager of human talent I've ever encountered in my whole life. So one by one, we decided to seek our fame and fortune and back in the day before the Internet to go out and meet other lawyers during the day. I couldn't have a practice. So my family gave me a desk and a phone and I started looking for other legal jobs. Lo and behold, they started bringing me all the undone legal work, claims, night court, leases, permits, yeah. applications, etc. And I realized I had an insight. I said, gee, there's a potential career here. So I spoke to my dad and my uncle, who were then running the company, and they called a family meeting. And the family meeting involved me um, presenting my opportunity, opportunities to them, what I thought I could do for the business. And my uncle turned to my father and said, Sandy, that was my father's name, said, 
if we hire Brett, we're going to have to pay him. Uh, <laughs> he said, right now, he's working for free. So, so my dad said, let's talk about it. But they gave me an offer. They gave me a, an offer at a very low starting salary, which I took and ran from there. All right. So you got hooked into the family business because, and this has been my experience, We've I've had a couple of businesses where there were attorneys in the business who didn't really want to be attorneys. They were business development people or they were operations people, but they were invaluable because then I could avoid what I thought I was going to hear you say it was your uncle was going to tell your dad that you could have, we could avoid all these legal fees because we've got Brent here now. It, it actually got worse because as we... In the parking industry, there are always bumps and curves in the parking industry. Yes. Candidly, as I considered myself general counsel to the company, I found myself weighing the opportunities to hire some really exceptional outside legal talent to help us with some problems that arose from time to time. And it actually got very expensive for us. Worth it, I will tell you. Yeah. But having those guidelines... Having that ability to decide when to pursue a situation with legal help or without it were critical turning points in a lot of our a lot of our businesses. All right. Part of the first question is I like to just turn the mic over to the people and just ask them to take us through. And so we're on that journey. So you be you're in the you're in the family business, but then somehow you got to central parking. Is that was that through acquisition or something? Or what happened? How did you get to central? You just skipped over twenty years of my Okay, then go ahead and go back twenty years. Just give me a little flavor because then I'm gonna start just know I'm gonna start digging into all these stories that you're alluding to. Brian, Brian. Nobody is an overnight, maybe three people in the world are overnight successes. (laughs) You work at it. um, Yeah. And over the course of 20 years, it's probably fair to say business development became a focus of my work outside of our traditional region, which was New York and New Jersey. We expanded into the Northeast, into Boston, West into Philadelphia and Pittsburgh, farther West into Indianapolis, South into Baltimore and and Washington in the course of the work. The the reason we restricted that area was my goal was to be able to have the thought that I could come home at the end of a day traveling. It didn't work out that way, but over the course of time, so this business development, government relations became very important for um, a lot of the work that we did. Zoning, challenges in court on approvals for parking lots, things like that, developing legislation or combating legislation that was critical to the success of the industry. And over time, I ended up yada yada, as they say, becoming president of the company on joining the board. And in the late 90s, Central Parking bought our family business. Okay. All right. So I did skip a couple of decades. Sorry about that. I'm so sorry. You did. So I would imagine in the early 70s, there was as much, or in the 70s and 80s, there was as much trying to figure out where to put a parking lot versus trying to steal it from another parking operator. Is that true? Or was there still this sort of zero-sum game that exists today? Zero-sum in many, in a mature market in New York became a zero-sum game as development took a lot of parking opportunities out of inventory. New York in the 60s and early 70s you could create a parking lot with with little complication. But as the laws changed, zoning changed, it became very difficult, almost impossible to obtain a new parking asset in New York. And even buildings in New York weren't required to have parking starting in the mid 80s so that new construction rarely had parking. So it was not necessarily a zero sum game, but it was a game of can you do better than the existing operator? Do you have a competitive advantage? Do you bring something to the table that somebody doesn't? And we were very aggressive in terms of New York City, certainly New York City commercial operations, and in Philadelphia as well. Yeah. Okay. So then what year did you become president of the company? Oh, goodness. It was probably probably in the early, early 90s. Okay. Okay. The early 90s, I would say. All right. And so the early 90s, this is before the internet. 
because the internet got the internet existed, but I can remember in 1989 when I graduated from college, so I'll date myself. I did have an email address, <laughs> but I could only send emails to my to the people that were at the University of Michigan. And then I, I can remember I dated myself. I, I remember someone telling me in the computer lab that if I had my friend's email address at Western Michigan University, I could send them an email. <laughs> I was like. <sighs> <laughs> we're a very early adopter. I know that my son was bar mitzvahed in 1993. And as a gift from Cousins, he received an Apple computer with oh, an wow. AOL disc. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think it was AOL 2.0 or something like that, which I inserted the disc and it opened a world to me that, that yeah. I didn't know existed. And the industry eventually caught up to the internet, eventually, but eventually. It, it wasn't fast. So my question was in 1990 or 92 when you took over, like what was considered cutting edge? So how did you stake, how did you stake your claim at the parking company to win business? What was the hook? We, we had, for example, in Manhattan, which is highly valet parking oriented, we operated and helped create and operate two significant self-park operations. Okay. One, one was an entire square block, which was the former site of Madison Square Garden, which was demolished, and they moved down to Penn Station, an entire square block. In fact, we equipped that with the most modern parking equipment, which was a ticket spitter and a gate, okay? <laughs> I delivered the gate to the site in a truck, and as I was driving out of the Lincoln Tunnel, the gate fell off the back of the truck. <laughs> traffic, And I needed about 12 policemen who wanted to give me a ticket to get it back in the truck because I was obstructing traffic. But we operated that for any number of years very successfully. And the other location we had was, is a, a project called Manhattan Plaza, which was a thousand car parking lot garage right outside of the Lincoln Tunnel. You had to drive virtually into the garage was the entrance there, which we helped design and operated for its first generation there. And we would we would say that we were innovators in the industry. We did use parking equipment, rudimentary, basic, and that we were candidly very aggressive on, on our pricing, our promotions, and things like that very early on. So I, uh, that, so that trips a, a memory of as when we've talked before, where you talked about the value of marketing and the I think you characterized the work that you did as like it, it was cutting edge or cutting edge, but it was pretty forward thinking at the time. And I know you're laughing because you're going to tell us what your version of marketing was. But the point that you were that you were doing it and not just relying on opening the gates and letting the cars fly in. So tell us about the 90s or the 80s version of marketing. You know, we opened at Newark Airport, um, um, probably the first significant off air location. Um, we, which I wrongfully named, I wrongfully named in the first instance, I called it the park and fly. And then I got a cease and desist letter from the park and fly folks. I didn't, I didn't mean to, to tramp on their trade name, but anyway, so we changed the name to the sky park and our, we needed to promote because being on a highway across from the airport, people aren't just going to drive in progressively. We got better at marketing. Um, we started out by putting a small ad in the local newspaper, and that didn't work. We, we commenced to do couponing in various mailers. That was not successful. We tried radio ads. I'm not sure that worked very well. But our marketing person, we hired an excellent marketing person, somehow convinced the Port Authority of New York to put up our billboards on the airport property and signed a contract to do that for a number of years. Now, once those billboards went up in the ads at the airport, our business just about boom at that point. Wow. We were catering to the users who were then at the time were paying three times what we were charging off air to, to generate business. It just it was educational. I, I don't have a marketing background. I, none of us did. We felt our way into success. I, so you've touched on one of my favorite components of figuring out business. And that is experiments never fail. 
You have to try experiments and you either fail or learn because you never really fail, right? Either, I guess you either successful or you learn because you never fail at experiments and you got to try different things. And it, it's really the only way. In hindsight, we all look like geniuses, but the fact is most of us are just trying to feel our way through it <laughs> and try and find something that works. One of my advisors once told me to, that, that I should only selectively use the word failure because it connotes a dead end. And the fact is some efforts just don't succeed, which is a better yes. way to look at it going yep. forward. I have tried to supplement my vocabulary with more, more positive thinking than that. So, yeah. so our efforts did not succeed, but they did succeed and it became a rousing success. That's great. Okay. So then, so you, you ascended to the throne in 92. Yes. You sold the business to Central. Yes. It I'll looked do. like you were only there a couple of years and, well, and then that well, was probably enough for you. I would tell you that among the folks at Central who I met, um, many of whom I admired, it was a success-driven company, um, yeah. less entrepreneurial than I was candidly than I enjoyed. At first, I enjoyed being out of authority that somebody else was making decisions. But then I realized that I missed that very much. And I decided after two and a half years that it was time to move on ostensibly to, quote unquote, spend more time with my family. <laughs> And play golf. Okay. So, so I'll tell you how that went. All right. I took lessons from a golf pro who completely screwed up every bit of talent I had in golf. Right? He just was going to remake my game in the image of somebody else. And candidly, it was a very frustrating experience. And then after six months at home, I would go to Starbucks, walk the dog, come home, hang around the kitchen. And Margie said, that's my longtime wife. My first and only wife, she said to me, Brett, what are you doing? I said, I'm waiting for lunch. She says, I've raised the kids. I have a life. You can't hang around here. Okay. She says, you've got to think about what you're doing next. I took her advice. I got an office in New York. I got a beautiful desk. I got office furniture. I sat there with a phone system. And lo and behold, I found out in life that if you have if you have quality relationships, uh, if you've built quality relationships, that you can stay in touch with people. And I received a call one day from someone that I'm very fond of, who I helped get the job of CEO of another parking company, called me, he said, we need some advice. I said, what are you calling for? He says, we need your advice. Okay. He said, I'd like you to meet with the owner of the company, which I did, who was a highly regarded investor, Bill Ackman, who at the time owned Infart. And he said, we'd like you to help us through some strategic um, ideas. I know your background from our CEO, who is Charles Hunsinger. And can, I think you can help us join our board. I said, I don't want to join the board. I'll help you. And we worked out a deal. And lo and behold, I found out that people are willing to pay for sage advice. And I launched career number two. Point dot two, as they say, I became a quote unquote advisor. Why did I call myself an advisor? Because it's a step up in my mind from a consultant. Uh, <laughs> no offense to any consultants out there. Okay. I know a lot of them and they're very good, but I found out as an advisor, it's a whole different, it's a whole different approach. Language yeah. is very important. And I launched my, my advisory service, which went on to do a number of illustrious transactions, assist in a number of illustrious transactions, some major transactions over time. So I then formed a small parking management company. I got involved, as you mentioned before, in, in deep philanthropy where I could actually make a difference. And it really opened up a new part of my life. That's awesome. Brett, why do you think parking is so hard? Why is it hard? Just, this is not an easy business. I will, I will tell you, and I used to try and take weekends off. But the, the, the problem with taking the weekend off is on Monday morning, I would call it the Monday surprise. People, <laughs> people weren't willing to tell you over the weekend what wasn't working correctly. And for several hours on Monday morning, my stomach would be turning because there were all these things 
that took yep. that needed attention. I wasn't the problem solver for everybody, but I was a filter for a lot of people that needed a solution internally in the company. It's there are high quality. It's a competitive business and yeah. competition makes you work much harder and much better. It's a serious business that you're providing. You have to provide a high level of service to people and remembering that their experience in parking can destroy a relationship for somebody else, a hospital, a hotel, a restaurant, yeah. what, whatever it may be. And sometimes that would combine into a kind of a messy situation. Uh, yeah. Aside from the internal workings of the business, there are the outside forces. There are the people, for example, that want to restrict access to center cities. There are zoning experts that say we don't need parking in cities anymore. There are people <laughs> that want to ban cars from downtowns. There are all these forces, outside forces that we deal with, um, it's certainly in major urban areas and in, in some secondary cities at this point that, that have to be dealt with in, in hopefully a positive way. It's, there are challenges. And each business is a separate, each location is a separate business plan, candidly. There's yep. some, no one size fits all. So right. you have to be cognizant of the fact, you have to be very flexible in this business. And candidly, I've learned a lot from my competitors over time, whether they share the information or I <laughs> or just- I gleaned it. I have colleagues across the country that have been more than willing to help me and me help them. While down the street, one of my colleagues may not be that anxious to, to share a problem. Yeah. I have found in serious issues that, that people can work together on a, on a regional, local basis to combat problems that affect us all. I think, so you, you touched on a couple of things that I, I had not thought of as far as parking being hard. The fact that the, of course, we talk about parking being the first and the last touch, but you also how much uh, the risk of letting down your customer because their customer is coming to park, not to park, but to go to wherever they're going, right? And so you are the face of that customer. That, that seems obvious, but it's not always obvious. And yet the, you're asking them for a big investment to make the experience good, right? It's critical. Right? Yeah. It, it really is. And once we forget that and once, and our people that are out in the field dealing with customers Goodness gracious, sometimes they have lapses and don't do the right thing. And it's always, there's always that challenge in front of you. Yeah. And then the second thing I think you touched on is just the relentlessness of it. That was one of the things that, that was eye opening for me when I arrived in parking seven years ago. Those cars are showing up whether you're ready for them or not. They are absolutely relentless. And the people driving those cars believe they have a God-given right to a parking space, yep. right? <laughs> Let me tell you, okay? We, we used to have significant parking around Madison Square Garden. Significant, okay? And the customers, many of whom were regulars, would drive. Yeah. Expe their high expectations. They wanted to get to the game or din dinner before the game. They wanted to get to the game and they wanted to get out. And if we couldn't meet those expectations, boy, we would hear it. We really would. One of the, we had, <laughs> we had a park, a small parking lot across from Madison Square Garden that was authorized to hold about 30 cars. But by God, uh, our attendant, Henry, would put about 65 cars in that lot, <laughs> and including borrowing some street space from time to time. And when the break came, uh, he would be out there. We would have extra people, but people would be out within five to six minutes uh, of getting there because that was their expectations. And that's why, candidly, they paid a premium to be there. Uh, yeah. And that's what it was all about. I will bet they paid a very pretty penny. <laughs> that's, uh, I will say at the time it was a premium. Uh, yeah. But premium service, premium yep. location. Yeah, no, and that, and you get them, you, you, they pulled up to the curb and got out of their car and Five or six minutes later, they were out. And he knew all his customers. I, I walked by after we sold our company and he said, hey, boss, how you doing? I said, I'm not your boss anymore. And he said to me very kind words. He said, you and your family were the only bosses I ever knew and respected. It was very sweet. Yeah. We had relationships like that with so many people, so many talented, able people that chose parking, valet parking as a career. 
it was very nice to see. Yeah, that, then that's one of the other things. Again, this is a deeply relational business that runs on trust. And so that's one half of it. So the relationships piece. But the other thing that I think, as the president of MPA, you probably saw this more than anything. What I found incredible is that an operator from New York would talk to an operator in California because generally there was very little chance that they were going to step on each other's toes. And so they were willing to share sort of secrets or insider information or whatever to help each other because there really was, there was was a geographical dispersion that was not going to lead to competition until I suppose these big national companies came into play, right? I agree. I agree. Not coincidentally, we did hire an intern in our business, okay? A young man by the name of Stephen Douglas who comes from the famous <laughs> Douglas Parking Company in Oakland, California. Yep. Yep. Stephen, Stephen graduated from college, and his father, Lee, sent a letter to several parking operators offering his son as an intern for two years. Now, I picked up the phone and hired Stephen on the spot, and he came to us full of vim and vigor. He has a booming voice, I must tell you. Yeah. He was the best intern we ever had. I, out of, he took a request for proposals from the Port Authority of New York out of a garbage can, which one of us threw out, and he resurrected it, and we became the parking operator in front of the World Trade Center for any number of years. Wow. Stephen took great pride in that location. In fact, when the captain of the Port Authority police ordered it closed for some reason or other, Stephen refused, and he ended up being put in the jail at, at, at the World Trade Center. And, and and he made a phone call to my uncle, who had to call the chairman of the Port Authority to have Stephen released from the jail. <laughs> and I will never forget that. It was true, hard work, loyalty. And then he came to me, said, my time is up. I'm going back to California to join my family in business. I said, is there anything we could pay you to stay? And he declined. He declined. He's been a great friend. I believe we taught him everything he knows about parking. He would say the opposite, that he's taught us a number of things. But the, in, in the industry, you develop those relationships, yep. and they don't go away. And they're high quality with serious people that, are, that, that love this business. Yeah, so that's interesting. We are fortunate to have Douglas as a customer, so I happen to know Stephen Douglas. And just just a great guy. So I'm going to make sure that he listens to this podcast well, so that he, he, can, he, he gets the recap if, of this. If, if, if he doesn't, it's a shame. Why? Well, actually, <laughs> while he was with us, he actually met his future wife, whose mother was in the parking business in Newark. His 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 wife, mother-in-law owns the famous Star Parking Lot in downtown Newark. And um, wow, I want you to know um, he's had a wonderful marriage. He has two great kids. Um, it's it's a great story. Yeah, that's a great story. Okay, so that leads directly into sort of my next question as I'm working down. Yes. What is it that makes parking people unique? Who who comes and stays in parking? People, if if you're not born into it or born into a parking family, people get into parking for various reasons. Everybody will have a story. Um, yes. Certainly the, the leaders of the industry, everybody has a story um, um, of one or another, either through a colleague uh, being recruited from a friend, um, having an early experience as a ballet parker someplace in college or high school, being enamored of the business. It's, there isn't a course in parking at colleges, but the NPA did institute parking certifications for knowledge yep. of the industry. Um, the, the other organization has a process as well. It's, I will tell you, and in recent years, we have attracted a much wider band of people, people that are fascinated by the emerging technology, yep. investors, financial people, public relations people, all kinds of, a whole gamut of industries that, yeah. that parking has become attractive to. Yeah. So I'm going to lead the witness just a little bit because I'm going to share it, like some of my insight around why parking people come to parking and stay. So it's been my observation that if you don't want to work hard, you don't stay in parking, right? And so the opposite of that is 
If you enjoy hard work and if you enjoy the fruits of your labor, I I believe that hardworking people come and stay in parking. And I believe that people with grit come and stay in parking because you have to want just a little bit of abuse and you have to thrive on just a little bit of abuse in order to stay in parking, right? But there are people like you who have gone through so many different experiences and yet stayed in parking because it is a great business. There are great relationships, but you almost have to want to get just a little bit beat up and enjoy that, I think, in order to be in parking. Don't you think? Aside from the outward business, I would add there's a complexion. There's a complexion being in a family business in parking, which adds a whole other layer of sometimes complexity to the room. Yes. I, I know... I, I would probably say, Brian, from my knowledge, no business is truly easy, okay? Sure. And if you're into parking and an entrepreneur and want to build a business and want to succeed in this business, there's nothing better that you can go out. You know, the barriers to entry in parking are not high, okay? You can probably go out as, a, as an industrious, enthusiastic person and open a parking location. You can secure a parking location. But when you go from one to two, you've doubled the size of your company, okay? And when you go two to four or or two to six, it's a multiplication table and you're building a business, okay? On on top of the fact that you're gonna, you wanna keep what you have and hopefully expand to some relative degree. But it's not easy, okay? It's not a gift and in retrospect, I can look at this from the years out of this. I've had a very fortunate career. I have been, I have been successful. I am successful. Okay. But there were nights that I didn't sleep. There were times when, and I've told this in another interview for the industry, there were times when I could write a check and it wouldn't clear. And a lot of people don't realize that you put a lot on the table in this industry. And and yet there are people willing to start up ventures, technology ventures, your company, great yeah. story, yeah. things that I've worked on that are willing to stake that experience and time to build something successful to provide a real customer solution that works right. for the industry. It's it's what I you do sometimes you do what you know. And yes, and I've learned over time that I think I know, but I'm always willing to learn and I'm always willing to, to try something different that might do things better. I think that so, again, so somebody who wants to come in and learn, who's somebody who can appreciate uh, a sort of a diamond in the rough because most people have no idea how hard parking is um, and until you're actually close to it and actually have to operate a parking facility or, or support a parking facility. And so, um, I, but I do like your point that most businesses are hard. Any good businesses, is hard. it's hard. So you know, harder it, than it looks. It, it looks nice to watch some people like, everybody points at Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and uh, you know, the other guy, the head of former, the, what was Twitter? <laughs> this is easy stuff. You know, build, right. building a business, you, you have to appreciate it in, in our country that you can get opportunities. You can right. succeed. Not everybody makes it. A lot of startups don't make it. Yeah. Um, but you can go back and you can do it again if you want and provide fulfilling careers for employees and executives along the way. This is so many people have had experience in parking and many have moved on to other things. They do. It's sometimes it's not a career that they want to stay with. Right. But they've learned something yep. about business and success. Yeah, no, that's good. Okay, so let's move on just a little bit to the the name of the podcast is Harder Than It Looks. Yes. Change is hard. Yes. And I think given your breadth of experience, just go back and and tell me what you think the hardest change or transition has been for parking over the 30 or 40 years that you've been around. The advent of new technology is can be jarring, candidly. Mm. Um, it pulls us into an area of discomfort, but I think we've all appreciated the fact that it provides a better experience. It provides a better business. And sometimes somebody has what they think is a solution, tech, technology solution that doesn't exactly work. And you have to go back and start over 
or re, re, redact it or redraft it or do something to adjust to a game yeah. that's not working. The fact that our industry is, and I, I think about New York and congestion pricing, things like that, and people are, are it, it may be a daunting, jarring impact in, in parking locations, but operators are facing that situation. They're prepared for whatever may come with difficulty, with, with sense some difficulty. Talk about yeah. hard. Wait, let me step back a second. I sure. Think, I think all of us, and, and sometimes we forget the lessons of the last few years when, when COVID started, okay, most of my businesses went close to zero almost overnight. And, yeah. And sitting there and dealing with what was supposed to be a short-term issue, which became a longer-term issue, we all had to do things, sometimes make difficult choices and other things, to carry on our businesses, to support our businesses and do things. Yep. Like it wasn't in anybody's business plan, okay? But we all persevered and we're all here, most of us. Some people couldn't make it, they'll be back, we will do something else. But I, I just wanna say, you, those challenges come that aren't planned and talk about grit and resilience and yeah. persistence and all those things that, that you need in life. That's If you're not prepared for something like that, at least mentally, it can destroy you. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that. so maybe the hardest transition was COVID. I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Reminding we, how soon we forget. Isn't, Isn't it incredible? incredible? We have yeah. such short memories. One, it's one, one of my businesses, which was a startup, my on-air company, which which provides, which, it, candidly, my customer solution is we sell the spaces that go unsold in a very successful way. But my co-founder, Pat Murray, called me in the midst of COVID. We were operating at about 40 off-air locations at the time. He says, Brett, we have no business. Everybody that booked with us wants a refund. Uh, the people that parked with us last month, the, the parking clients want to get paid. He said, and he's young, I, I love him. He says, if I have to go deliver newspapers like I did when I was a kid, I'll go do it to support this company. And as he's sitting there and I'm saying, sometimes you put money aside for a rainy day. And I said, this is the rainy day. I said, Pat, we're going to cover everybody. We're going to take care of our obligations. We're going to go forward. I don't know how long this is going to take. As I'm saying that, my hand is shaking because I said, I'm going to make, we're going we're gonna to make good on yeah. this. But some, yeah. you do the right thing for the right reasons. And as we came out of COVID it, it, and business rebounded dramatically, the people that we, that we treated appropriately didn't forget. Okay. And yeah. I, I, it's, it's, somebody once said that, that the character is doing the right thing when nobody's watching. And right. that really makes a difference. Yeah. All right. So the last question before we go to the lightning round here okay. is parking people are like military people. I love speaking, talking to military people, former military, because they always have great stories. Uh, one of my co-founders in a former business was in the Marines and he had, he could tell a hundred stories. I'm, I know that you to be a man who can tell great stories. So I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you to tell me, it doesn't have to be the best story. The day that you, uh, Jacked up the door on the car. That might be a good story, but maybe you've got a better story. I'll be uh, succinctly. I, I was a parking attendant in Philadelphia my first year in law school, making $25 a day in quarter tips, I want you to know. I, I really <laughs> hustled, okay? The location had not only a man lift, but a sliding pole, which I managed to negotiate. But one day backing up a customer's car, and looking, leaving the door slightly open, making sure I didn't hit the pole. I hit the pole, Not only, but I hit the pole, but I kept going. And, and the door of the car was literally on the hood of the car. And I go, holy shit, this is the worst day of my life. And I walked down to the head of operations, wonderful man. I said, you have my resignation. I'll pay for the damage, I'm done. He says, what are you talking about? We went to look at the, look at the damage. He says, no worries. He says, it's early in the day. He says, that car is going to the body shop. They'll have it back before the customer comes back at night. Lo and behold, the door was back on the car. The work was done. He explained to the customer that there was a minor incident with the car. <laughs> it's all fixed. And I, didn't get, I, I didn't have to resign and I didn't have to pay for the damage. The other story that I thought of the other day, a friend of mine is, is going to Lake Placid for the weekend. Beautiful place in 
in, in the late seventies, they announced that the winter Olympics were going to take place in Lake Placid. And I decided that we could be the parking operator for the Lake Placid Olympics. I didn't know what I was talking about, but wouldn't that be great? So yeah. we pitched that we would be the parking operator for the Lake Placid Olympics. Lo and behold, we're selected. We are selected to operate four or five remote locations because there was going to be no traffic to downtown Lake Placid. We hire students from Plattsburgh College who closes for the week and, and we open up the parking. Now, there were some complications. The bus company they hired didn't show up. There were some other things, but everybody gets parked. And I'm in charge of cash collection. No credit cards, by the way. This is 1980. Nobody knew yeah. you could pay for it. I'm in charge of cash collection and going to the bank. And as I tell the story, we had arranged to have an account at a local bank in Lake Placid. And I walk in with four shopping bags full of cash. <laughs> Like, what is this? I said, this is the parking money from the locations. And they go, oh, we've never seen that much money in this bank. And they lock the door. OK, they put the shades down. OK, so <laughs> nobody sees the cash. And they start counting the cash. It was about $40,000 from opening day. And every day after, it was about the same. And I just had such a such a great feeling that we pulled this off handedly. And then afterwards, this is an even better ending. We, we did an accounting. It was a sharing with the Olympic Committee. And we did our accounting. And I called up the Olympic Committee. I said, we have a check for you. They said, what's it for? I said, for the parking excess that we owe you. And they said, excess? Oh, none of our other vendors are giving us any excess. And I'm kidding myself. I said, did, did we miss an opportunity here? One of those things. <laughs> But we sent him about four hundred thousand dollars in, in wow. proceeds from the Olympics. It was a heartwarming story about um, yeah. organization coming together for a couple of days. Um, yeah. In, in the meantime, though, one one side story: we did agree to sponsor one of the contestants for the U.S. bobsled team. Okay, <laughs> who who were candidly a bunch of drunks who got together one night at some bar and said, "Let's do the bobsled," and we were funding them. They showed up. Um, for the trials, um, having spent the night on the town, okay, completely inebriated, not little, they didn't qualify for the finals. But there are many stories about the opportunities we pursued and openings and taking risks, Brian. Yeah, um, for that sure. People wouldn't do. We were not adverse to risks in terms of yeah. the work that we did. That's awesome. What a great, those are a great couple of stories. Thank you for sharing those. All right, so we're going to go into the lightning round. You, you chuckled a little bit about the lightning round. Yeah, uh, I, I've just got three or four or five questions here, and, sure. and just just give me just give me a, 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 the thought that comes okay. to your mind okay. as soon as I ask it. Okay, and so if somebody hears a phrase and they instantly think of Brett Harwood, what is it? What is your phrase? What are you known for saying? I used to say quite frequently that this is a great country. In fact, one of my partners gave me a hat with that saying on it. I don't know what I did with the hat, but this is a great co country that 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 does, does give us opportunities to succeed. So interestingly enough, I, I didn't think you would pull this out of your hat, but when I think of Bashir, I think of Bret, Bret Harwood, by well, the way. I, I must tell you, I, I, I have taught Yiddish, okay, which is Jewish um, um, the Jewish slang from Europe, um, uh, Eastern Europe, um, to many people, I have a Yiddish dictionary. Besher means, so that we know, meant to be. Some things are meant to be. Um, yeah. More than once in my life, whether it's a relationship, whether it's an opportunity, whether it's just one of those coincidental things that happens, that, that things that I, I use that term to describe the event. Um, and it gives me a lot of pleasure when I explain it to people and they understand what it means. Yeah, I, I think Bashir has brought us together. So I, what I appreciate is most of all is that that we had this opportunity to do this. This is most fun for me, actually. All right. The second thing, the second question I have is, what's the hardest thing you've ever had to do in life? What's the hardest thing you've ever done? That's a thought-provoking question because there have been any number of things. When I was practicing law, my firm did bankruptcy work um, uh, and 
serious bankruptcy work, chapter 11, corporate reorganizations, things like that. And and it, it wasn't the worst thing. Ever, but but my senior partners sent me up and sent me to a calendar call on a Friday when most of the senior uh, lawyers were playing golf. And the bankruptcy <laughs> judge told me that he was going to hold me in contempt if I couldn't get my senior partner off the golf course to answer a question. And I told him that wouldn't be possible. And he said, I hope you're prepared to spend the weekend in jail. And it turned out he smiled. He said, he said, it was a joke. I didn't get the joke. I missed the punchline. No, seriously, we did face in the company some significant, um, significant financial challenges over time. Significant fire in downtown Philadelphia that closed 11 of our locations for weeks, if not months. Oh, wow. Um, a financial, there was a, a recession in the early 90s that set us back. We had uh, leveraged ourselves pretty well. We had a lot of serious work to do to correct it. We did what we had to do. We corrected it. But there were many serious discussions with lenders and, and people like that were daunting. At one point, I did say to our senior bankers that they could have the company if they wanted. Um, and I half meant it at the time, seriously. They said, we don't want it. Let's work. Let's work this through. But facing those issues is a it's And it's not a single challenge. It's days of challenge. It's weeks yeah. it's months of challenge. Yeah, it's a slug, right? It's, there it, there are so many decisions that hang on the is. vitality of the company it or is. not. It is. Yeah. And, and you just have to have that those deep resources internally to deal with that. We did effectively as a team. We worked it through. Yeah, that's great. OK. All right. So if you could wave your magic wand and fix one thing in parking, what would it be? <laughs> Maybe I should have sent you the questions ahead of time. Well, no, 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 this, is, this is really good. You just wish that everything worked like a fine like a finely tuned orchestra. That yeah. All these pieces come together, all meshes, and it all works, okay? And in the main, Brian, most of the time, it does, okay? Yes. Most of the time. But you just wish that, that the Monday morning surprise doesn't come, okay? <laughs> <laughs> or the complete screw-up. Let's yeah. call it yeah, a yeah. screw-up that uh, of the law of unintended consequences when you do something, and it, it results in, the fact that you're like sick to your stomach. Okay. That's yeah. I wish that well, I have, I, I can absolutely relate to that. I have Mondays like that where I come in and I ask Tammy Baker, Parker COO, how did it go over the weekend? And I say, I kind of wince. <laughs> it happens. It's real. That's, that's life. I, I will tell you, there's less of that these days as other people are doing things um, that I don't, but I've been, I have not stopped um, evolving. And as you said earlier, I have some investments in some um, evolving companies that have yeah. been a challenge. I think it's great. I think it keeps me active and energized. And you work through these things. Hopefully, yeah. with, I like smarter people than me. Okay. <laughs> and I think I've been fortunate that, that I surround myself with, hopefully, those that crew. I, have, I happen to know a couple of people that you hang out with, and they're pretty smart. I don't know if they're smarter than you, but they're certainly pretty smart. You, you asked me one thing. I, I have a theory in life, candidly, that, that nice guys can finish first. And I, I do have that reputation. And uh, I have been cultivating relationships. In fact, once I was giving a lecture to students at my college, and I explained that my life is like Einstein's universe. It's always expanding. And a young student raises his hand. He says, Mr. Harwood. I said, yes. He says, I'm an astrophysics major. I said, congratulations. <laughs> Let me explain Einstein's theory to you. He says, the universe is not only expanding, but it's accelerating. I said, listen, let me give you my take, okay? I'll take the expansion. The acceleration, I'll leave to somebody else. And he was a little dejected. And afterward, I said, I didn't mean, mean it, but I meant it as a lighthearted Comment, yes, but I have a wealth of um, uh, relationships that keep evolving, and, and yeah, it's been a great part of my life. Yep, uh, that's great. All right, so then, what what do you do when you're not parking cars? I what's what's, about, what's relaxing? Wait, I have a whole different, I have a whole life outside this room. I have a beach house in New Jersey. Okay, yep. Jersey okay. Shore. 
Not yep. the Jersey Shore, okay? There's different Jersey Shores. I, <laughs> um, I My family is, loves the Jersey Shore. Okay. Loves it. Yeah. I, I will tell you, it's it's been great for a long time. And I have a, a winter residence in Sarasota, Florida. Okay. Yep. I have two kids. I have a granddaughter and some step-grandchildren. I have a wife. Margie and I are celebrating our, I'm going to get this right or I'm going to screw it up. Uh, 53rd wedding anniversary in August, wow. 53 years. That's a long time. That's a long time. Congratulations. 53 I'm still, years. I'm still working to get it right and I'm willing to try. I want. That's why you're still married. You're still working to get it right. Pat's it. off to you. I'm working at it. And my philanthropy, I have been a hospital chairman for a challenged hospital that is now okay. very, very successful. And I sit on the board of big brothers and big sisters in my region and I volunteer as a big brother to a to a guy who, bless him, he graduated from high school. He'd gone to Boston College for engineering. Wow, uh, a long, good long for way. you. And and some other stuff. Okay, so, some other stuff. I don't do not play golf. Golf is over. I, I, you, you banished golf. I, said, oh. I gave. I turned my clubs in at the Department of Public Works on recycling day. <laughs> Great set of golf clubs. About a thousand unused golf balls, range balls, unused golf clubs. They were bidding on my stuff. The, the Department of Public Works guys. So that is hysterical. So I'm sure they're doing much better with the stuff than I ever did. That's great. All right. So last question. Yes. So what are you most proud of? Oh goodness. Oh, that's it. You could pick. I know it's a super hard question. Just pick something in parking, so your family doesn't feel slighted. <laughs> This is this is about parking. I, I can tell you, I can look back and smile. Okay, that that the park, as I said earlier, parking business has been very good to me and my family. Okay, we made it good. Okay, but it's there, the rewards are there for hard work, for creativity. Okay, and and for people listening to this, I'm not an overnight success. I, it it took me decades to achieve stuff with setbacks. And I just want you to know that, that I'm, I'm proud of being at the other end of this cycle, being able yeah. to say that this has worked, okay? It continues to work. It's not a magic formula. It's hard work, it's diligence, and not without its aggravations. There's stuff going on now that I'm not talking about that I'm dealing with, all right? But looking back, it's a, a, the sense of accomplishment, quality accomplishment, and having, and, and the relationships the broader relationships have been very important. Yeah. That, yeah. that energizes me candidly. So it's all been good. This is good. I can tell you that I have been in the industry seven years. It took us almost five years to truly meet and spend some time together. And from afar, you, you, I assumed, I made an assumption that you were this tough New Yorker and nothing could be further from the truth. I'm sorry that we didn't get to meet each other in year one. You are... Let me, you, there are, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's a whole bunch of people I haven't met yet. I told you my universe is expanding, number one. Yes. Who is, let me correct the record. I'm from New Jersey, good or bad, okay? And Fair enough. And I'm not a New Yorker, which uh, I don't know what, whatever that means, okay? <laughs> You're going to stop right there, aren't you? I'm going to censor myself. But anyway, as, as I said, Brian, we, in life, you get opportunities to meet people sometimes at the right time for the, all the right reasons. And this has been very fortuitous. The fact that you reached out to do this, I'm complimented candidly. Okay. And I, as you can see, I warm up to this very quickly. Okay. Yeah. I knew you were going to be great. That was the other reason that I put you in the, that I wanted to put you in the saddle for sure. Well, if I'm not, you're going to edit this down so that I'm <laughs> okay. This is, you're going to make me look better than I am. That's the goal. That, that is absolutely, if, if I can't do that, then this show is not going to last long. So okay. wish me luck. I, I do wish you a whole bunch of luck. And I know you're on a good, good route. I know you have a high quality company providing a, a, a superb, unique service. Okay. I must say. Um, yeah. Appreciate that. And I, I was around when it was somebody's brain cloud that, that came up with this idea. <laughs> I know more than I say sometimes, but this is, you're really on a great path. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate that so much. All right. Let, let's take it home this way. First of all, let me thank you for taking time and well, spending time with us on Harder Than It Looks, a parking podcast. And just, 
I appreciate your friendship more than anything. You've been great to get to know, and that's what I want people more than anything to know. I'm, I'm going to try and win you a bunch of friends because the people that see you from afar, I'm going to encourage them to to uh, come up and, and strike up a relationship and a conversation I, I, with you. I will tell you, nothing pleases me more candidly than to get to hear people's stories, to get to know them. And it's, as I said, it's made my life fulfilling, candidly, and it, and it continues to do that. And if once you stop, if you stop doing that, you might as well. Okay, yeah. Fire, okay. You might as well stop. That's yeah. It. That's it for sure. Well, All right. Thank that. You. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for your time. So that wraps up the the first ever episode of Harder Than It Looks, a parking yep. podcast. Yep. We've uploaded the first three episodes, and we'll expect to publish at least one interview per month going forward. So add us to your library. Send us your suggestions for other interesting parking people that you should, that you would enjoy listening to, and uh, come back each month. So until then, so long and good parking. Okay, that's a wrap on this episode of Harder Than It Looks: Parking Uncovered, presented by Parker Technology. Please leave us a review if you liked what you heard. Make sure you tune in next month as we continue to uncover tips, tricks, and best practices to manage what we all know is harder than it looks: parking a car. Bye for now.